Welcome to session 33 of Worlds of Speculative Fiction. We're uh, starting uh, year four, so that's, that's pretty cool. And I decided this time around that maybe it was time to go back to some classic authors that everybody else we'd been uh, looking at was, was referencing, and I thought Poe would be one of those. Um, we're going to do Chesterton and... and um, uh, Mary Shelley and a few others like that as well before we jump into our, our usual fair. Um, and Poe is somebody that, you know, we all got introduced to, I imagine, back when we were in grammar school uh, because, you know, they would have us read The Raven or, or, you know, some of his stories. And he really made it into the canon of American literature. Um, he wasn't quite so popular in his own day. Unfortunately, he, he wasn't well remunerated for the things that he did. And, I, you know, we were talking a little bit about the books at the start. So I have these, my, my great uncle Hubert, um, I don't know where he acquired these, but these are from what's left of his collection, the, these complete works of Edgar Allan Poe. These are from 1903 or two, it's a little hard for me to, to read, uh, but you know, five, five volumes, I only brought two of the volumes in because I, I thought the ones that had the poetry and, and the short stories would be the most useful. Um, so, you know, I think as usual, I'll have some philosophical themes to bring up. All of you, you know, I'm sure have, have quite a few other philosophical themes to, to bring up as well. I've, I've um, put together some short passages from some of his, his works that I think are particularly interesting. And, and we'll talk about his biography, which is fairly short because he died pretty young, younger than, than me, um, and uh, much more miserably, I hope, than I do. Um, but, you know, he, he had a very interesting life. Um, I, I don't know that we can talk that much about world building. This is something I, I, I guess I should bounce off, off of all of you at, at the start because we often in these sessions talk about, you know, the fictional world that's created by these authors. And I, I don't know that we can, we, you know, he does have this piece from near the end of his life where he's speculating about the universe, Eureka, a prose poem, but that's not really... It's not really fiction. It's it's supposed to be philosophy, natural philosophy, um, and you know bits and pieces of it, I guess, show up in his works. But you know, do you do you guys think that there's a coherent world view or picture running throughout Poe's stories? It would be the world of the exotic. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. Or or the um, macabre or. Yeah. Um, because I, I was when I picked this book up, I said, you know, tales of the grotesque and the arabesque. And I was trying to <laughs> yeah. think, okay, grotesque, I get, but arabesque, you know, yeah. Arab-like. I'm thinking, what would be Arab-like or Arabian? Why would they refer to that? And I thought the only term I could come up with was like, you know, something that's unusual or exotic. Yeah, which, exactly. Which was was the, you know, which the, the Arabian world was at that time. So. Um, but but they they were I mean they they were the, the things that he focuses wrote on. about and focused yeah. on I mean and they they just were it's hard this Victorian language is hard to pick that did you find it hard <laughs> to read it's just it's just tedious well you know I, I wonder too because of Poe having been assigned to us all of you got assigned Poe right yep. when, when, when you were in school, in school? Yeah. and Absolutely. and, and sure. it might have been a chore. Uh, for us, I, I know that reading it today, I, I wasn't I wasn't like super pleased or, or you know I didn't have a great relish for his phrasing and, and vocabulary. And, um, I, I like the ideas in the stories, but I, I, I too yeah. And the, the language was so tedious to get through that it was hard to focus on actually what he was getting at you know the whole thing and, and, yeah. and, and there were some really interesting themes that he was trying to, to you know relate through some of these stories yeah and um but oh, the tedium. you know when I mean, you're reading at night and i don't know you just probably stay awake better than i do but <laughs> getting tired and it's like oh Lordy. i like the rhythm of his poetry mm -hmm. that, yeah there's nothing quite like that i think 
I was going to say the poetry yeah. was After a little reading easier. some of the poetry, I found the prose easier to get through because you get used to the vocabulary. Yeah. That, yeah, that makes but sense. He, he really loves his long descriptions of the furnishings and the... Mm -hmm. You know, he, he, he has a piece called The Philosophy of Furniture. I don't know, have any of you ever read that one? No, miss that. No. It's, um, it's kind of funny. I mean, it's, it's not a, it's not a, a story at all. And, and I don't know exactly where he published it, because he published things all over the place. Um, but he talks of, yeah, this, this book, it actually begins with that. And he says that Americans are badly off because we don't have an aristocracy of blood. So having therefore as a natural and an, indeed and as inevitable thing fashioned for ourselves an aristocracy of dollars, the display of wealth has to take the place and perform the office of heraldic display in monarchical countries. So he, he goes on and on about like how Americans are so vulgar and, and, and you know, use the wrong kind of furnishings, they mistake, uh, as he says, magnificence for excellence. And then he actually suggests what he thinks a, a well-furnished apartment would look like. Um, yeah, he, he, he hates glitter, as he calls it. Uh, he, he, he particularly complains about the American tendency to have lots of mirrors, you know, spread throughout a place, and he says it makes it um, confusing. Then he sketches out this place that's like um, kind of dim, and there's rich crimson silk curtains fringed with a deep network of gold, he says, lined with a silver tissue. There's no cornices. Um, there's, there's rich gilt work. So you can start imagining this, this room, right? And then he says, uh, the colors of the curtains and their fringe appear everywhere in profusion and determine the character of the room. And he, he goes on to talk about the, the Saxony carpet and, and all of that. So he lays out what he thinks we do wrong a, as a culture uh, in decorating. <laughs> and outlines what good decoration would look like. And, it, and it's quite lengthy. Well, even um, Mask of the Red Death, it's kind yeah, of just walking true. you through these seven rooms. Yeah. There's actually a board game of it. I was oh, really? Say. At the board game Barrister, there's a... Okay. Like, I think it's sort of like, um, is it Clue? The one where people are murdering yeah. each other Clue. secretly yeah. on steroids. <laughs> Um, but they got the order of the colors of the rooms correct. Oh, which good. Which pleased me. <laughs> yeah. Um, Fall of the House of Usher has some yeah, well, dis that's dis descriptions, too. And then there's one about the lovers who commit suicide in Venice. Like, they reunite briefly, and then... Yeah, and, and another one that has a lot of description of background, apartment. too, is uh, where it plays an important role is um, Purloined Letter. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. He goes into the you know the taste of the the person's place and and uh, you know the reason why the letter you know does make sense where it is is because it's deliberately kind of frayed up and and, and stained uh, so you you would neglect it you know not in a room that's so opulent uh, and, and well furnished so uh, going back to the question is there a narrative universe I, I don't I don't know if there's a a narrative a universe, universe but, but no but, but maybe a different he's looking at this world he's in different looking at ways. this world with a right. macabre view right. yeah. yeah he's looking at this world as not as clean and pretty <laughs> you know that kind of reminds me do you guys remember that show tales from the dark side yeah. from the 80s mm -hmm. yeah. i loved that yeah. intro to it because it would talk about you know beneath the, the world that we see there's there's a dark side and I forget exactly how it ran, but it was something like, just like ours, but not so brightly lit. <laughs> you know? Yeah, and that would describe Poe to me. I just always think of it as dark and in yeah. numerous ways, but dark. Yeah, you know, some people call him the, one of the early figures of dark romanticism. You know, where romanticism, you've got this kind of optimistic... Um, viewpoint and appeal to intuition and you know the past and all that um, things things can get better and better and better and then you have these darker figures who um, don't they're, they're more skeptical of it they think that that human nature is m more screwed up or that the world is dingier if not necessarily dirtier than uh, than the other romantics 
Uh, you know, it just feels like he's depressed much of the time, that he's coming from a depressed state of mind. Well, there, there's a, like five out of the six different stories I've written here, and I read ones that I hadn't read before. They're not the classics. Yeah. He refers many times over to this is like an, in an opium dream. He refers oh, to the yeah. phrase opium dream over and over again. Yeah. So obviously the guy, opium dream. Oh. So the guy was obviously an opium user because he refers to it so often and he refers to it so descriptively that he's been <laughs> yeah. there. Yeah. Was yeah. he or, because I remember, I think it was one of the Bronson Ballet who actually wrote something so well people thought she had taken opium and she just said, no, I used a lot of imagination. So I find myself wondering, Interesting. did Poe actually, do we know in this biography? Uh, I just looking to see. Probably well, he certainly drank he a lot. Yeah. Oh. You know. Um, I, don't, I don't know if he. I don't know if he used opium. So maybe he wrote about opium as like the romantic, exotic version of alcoholism. Well, sure seems to me. Well, like he might have been there a few times. You know, he he had um, a literature to draw upon, though. I mean, Coleridge was mm -hmm. already somebody big on the scene, um, and and you know, Poe knew him through through uh, sort of the intermediary of of the. American transcendentalists, I, I think. So, I don't know. That's, that, that's a good question. Well, let's talk about his biography because he had a pretty rough life. Uh, and, you know, if you want to understand him as, as depressed, I think that makes perfect sense uh, given all the things that he, he went through. Um, as a matter of fact, it's, it's, it's kind of amazing he accomplished as much as he did given all the challenges that he faced. So he's, he's born in 1809. Um, to this David and Elizabeth Hopkins Poe, and David Poe, like, leaves the year after that. They're both actors. Um, she, he, he abandons uh, her and little Edgar and then his older brother William and the uh, younger uh, daughter Rosalie. And then um, just a year after that, his mother dies of consumption, tuberculosis. Right? They called it consumption back then. And he winds up being adopted by John and Francis Allen. This is where the Edgar Allen part comes from. And um, he, you know, he has a kind of tumultuous relationship with, with John Allen. Um, sometimes he's really, sometimes his, his adopted father is really uh, nice to him and, you know, treats him very well and tries to promote him. At other times he punishes him quite, quite severely. Um, he winds up being baptized with, with them in the Episcopal Church, and you know I think all of you know at that time that really that was sort of like the top of the Protestant hierarchy. You know, mm -hmm. uh, if you were if you're poor, you were probably a, a Methodist or a Baptist, and then you like make your way up to the Lutherans and Presbyterians. Now Eventually you're Eventually, so, the Episcopals. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. So, and and in, in a place like Virginia, that really mattered quite a lot. Um, they relocate to Great Britain, and now you, you notice in his biography, he winds up going to um, schools, but he's on his own, and he's a you know he's like six years old when he's sent to this grammar school in, in Irvine, while his adopted parents are in London. So, you know he he would have been with charges, but I don't think he he really got much of an opportunity to do this sort of. Um, bonding that that we typically um, expect to happen in childhood, um, and then he, he goes into another uh, boarding school near London, and then enters this manor house school at a suburb of London. Isn't part of that just the way they you know they looked at children a lot differently yes. back yeah, then? Yeah, just the way they educated them. Yes, yeah, and the, if you had means, you wouldn't be going to boarding school. Yeah. yeah. But also, there wasn't the bonding wasn't a big thing for a lot of people. Yeah, children yeah. are children. Yeah, they're almost alien species. Yeah, almost. yeah I mean, you, you'd, you'd foist them off onto nurses or tutors or people like that. Um, I, I don't imagine you know that human nature has changed that much, though. And you think of what that must have been like for a lot of those kids, even with you know sort of a. If we do that, right, we send, we send off a kid, say, to military school or boarding school, there's usually like this, well, you know, the kid must have done something wrong uh, sort of assumption. Yeah, yeah. And you're right, that wasn't there at the time. 
Um, but I think it must have still been quite hard for him. Well, you know? yeah, I think the mothers probably had more objection, but it was more the father who would send them off, and the woman had to capitulate to the man back in those days. So it, yeah. so, but I'm sure it was harder on the mothers to have the children shipped off, but it was just sort of a rite of passage for these kids. To, and the, the, you know, the fathers, the dads didn't want, I don't think they did want them around. You know, they were just sort of taking up the mother's time, and that was his property, and, you know, there was all kinds of... If you were in the upper class, the lower class, that didn't, that wasn't still much You know, the case. too, I guess with mortality being as high as it was back then as well, why invest an awful lot of time into kids that are, you know, quite probably going to die? To die. Five, yeah. yeah. Well, this, this biography talks about how when he was adopted by the Allens, the Allens didn't have any children. Yeah. And they were merchants. They weren't wealthy. In not fact, until later. Not until yeah. much later when they yeah. inherited something. But it sounded like the father had a hot and cold relationship. On the one hand, since his wife didn't have any children, this was the only son he was going to have. Yeah. At the other, on the other side, it wasn't his real son. Well, so and he, he went wanted back him to be a, a blood certain son. Yeah. yeah. So he went back and forth in terms of how I treat him. Yeah. How you treat, him. and then Poe, as he got older, caused his father lots of problems. Oh yeah. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we're going to get into that in, in, in just a bit. Uh, but, you know, if you think about it, he's, he probably was a pretty, you know, precocious, smart kid. Um, and so those are always challenging to deal with, you know. Um, now, they, they eventually they moved back to, to Richmond. Um, seems like, like Edgar is starting to, you know, fit in <clears throat> pretty well. And then, like, you know, like you said, they, they only become wealthy later on. This ri literal rich uncle dies, William Galt, and he leaves John Allen a lot of, a, a lot of land, a lot of wealth. And um, around that same year, Edgar begins this relationship with Sarah Elmira Royster. Um, and then, you know, he... He goes on and he, he enrolls uh, at the University of Virginia, which was kind of an experimental place at the time. And um, it really wasn't well put together. It was, it was, it was, it was uh, Jefferson played a role in establishing it, and it was supposed to be like a new kind of school. Um, the uh, students would, would have a lot of leeway and uh, democratic participation in the school itself, but nobody quite knew how to make this work. And as a result, it was, it was rather chaotic. So when Edgar Allan Poe goes there, he winds up in, in debt. And some of the debts are because he liked to gamble and drink and things like that. Uh, but some of the debts were because um, things were just so disorganized. And so he, he starts um, getting estranged from his father over these issues of debts. His father, you know, thinks that, that he's, uh, we might say, underperforming, you know, as, as in a moral sense. And at the same time, um, Edgar and Sarah secretly get engaged before he goes off to school. And her father destroys the letters. So she doesn't know that Edgar is writing him all this time. She thinks that he's gone off to school and he's just sort of left her and not interested. And um, then she ends up marrying somebody else. Um, he, will, he will run into her again later in, in life. Um, eventually he drops out of the university and he relocates to Boston and he starts doing a lot of um, writing professionally, works as a clerk and as a newspaper writer. Um, Sarah gets married to somebody else, and this is when he brings out his, his first poems. Um, and he's living pretty hand-to-mouth at, at, at the time. Um, he's, not, he's not making a, a lot of income. As a matter of fact, he'll be poor a good portion of his life. Um, and then he enlists in the army, in, in part because he's just not making enough money um, doing, doing what he's doing. And he lies about his name. He enlists as Edgar A. Perry, and he lies about his age. He, if I remember right, I think he said he was 21 years old at the time, and he, of course, wasn't. He was 18. And very quickly, he moves up through the ranks. Now, I don't know exactly what this rank of sergeant major of the artillery means. Clearly, it couldn't have been like a sergeant major in the sense that we're used to it today. Um, but he, he's in there, and then he decides he wants to get out of the army. 
So he goes to his, his uh, commanding officer, and he tells him, hey, I lied about my name, I lied about my age, um, you, you can't actually hold me to the oath, um, you should you know, get me out of here. And his commanding officer says, because his commanding officer knows him pretty well by that time, he says, I will let you go if you reconcile with your father. And so there's some back and forth going on, and um, Alan has a, a um, sort of come to Jesus moment after his wife dies, but he also has conditions. He says, I will let you leave the army, and I'll be reconciled with you, but you're going to go to West Point. So in some ways, it's like going, you know, from the proverbial frying pan into the fire, right? <laughs> And, and Poe goes to West Point, and while he's there at West Point, he, you know, he, he does um, continue writing. Um, he, he, all, he doesn't just write poetry, too. He writes satirical stuff about uh, what the army is like. Um, and um, eventually, um, there are some, some new problems. Uh, Alan marries this, this new wife, Louisa Patterson, and gets into quarrels with Edgar Allan Poe about that uh, and about other things as well, and then disowns him. Uh, meanwhile, Poe um, decides that he wants out of West Point, so he deliberately gets himself court-martialed, which is a terrible way to, to get out. Um, doesn't have quite the effects that a, a dishonorable discharge would today, um, you know, from, from the current army because everything's, you know, electronic now, but um, it was still quite a, a black mark. Um, and so he goes back to Baltimore and he lives with his aunt and his brother. His brother ends up dying. Poe starts trying to live, a, 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 a earn his living as a writer. <clears throat> and from that point on, he's, he's basically doing that. Um, and venture after venture after venture, in effect, fails. Um, so things will work for a short time and then not work for a short time. He actually has a piece, I don't know if I have it in here, where he, he complains about <clears throat> how bad the people who run the uh, magazines are. Uh, I don't know if I brought that one with me. No, unfortunately I didn't. But it, it's, it's quite a good um, story. He finishes it by saying, I'm not actually impugning the character of anybody uh, in real life. All the magazine people that I know are just, you know, upstanding gentlemen. Um, and I'm, I'm just going by what I've heard happen to other people. But you know it's, it's actually his own experience. He talks about, like, not getting paid um, for months and months and months. Um, finally getting letters back from them saying, we're about to publish your piece and we'll pay you six months from now. So, you know, that, that's, that's pretty rough. Um, he winds up uh, getting some, some prizes, uh, and then he becomes the assistant editor of the Southern Literary Messenger, um, gets fired for, for showing up drunk to work, and then gets reinstated after, after a little while. He also marries uh, his cousin, and she's 13 years old at the time. Um, the witness attests that she's 21, so she probably looked a little bit you know, older than 13, but she was actually 13 at the time. Um, he winds up you know, working for, for a couple different magazines, uh, different different points in time. Burton's Gentleman Magazine, Graham's Magazine, and and one of his his pet projects that he never was able to bring about, he wanted to found a new literary magazine called the Stylus. He even drew up a prospectus for it and took out an advertisement in uh, the newspaper, uh, trying to you know solicit funds to to do this. And it you know he first started doing this. Back in when, 1840, at, the, at his time when he died in 1849, he still hadn't brought it off. It was still uh, not a pipe dream, but um, you know, just it wasn't it wasn't happening. Um, by that time, he'd already you know published his first novel. It was really only novel, and um, tried publishing a play, uh, Politian, which which. He did it in installments. It got really bad reviews, so he just he gave up on that. Um, and he um, 
1842, his, his wife starts showing the first signs of consumption. And, and, you know, there's a lot of people in his life who are dying of that. And there's a lot of characters who uh, end up having that as well. And you notice he's becoming more and more productive in terms of the stories. I didn't put all the stories in there or all the poems. I just put in the ones that we're particularly interested in as science fiction or horror or detective novels. Um, but he, he starts drinking more and more. Um, he's, he's doing quite a bit of writing. He talks about um, writing taking him a good bit of time, too. So he doesn't have a, you know, dash it out kind of writing process that I think a lot of other people that we've looked at do, where they could write thousands of words per day. Um, the thing that makes his reputation, besides literary criticism, most, most of the, what he's being uh, known for at this time is his literary criticism, and he's known as being a really tough, mean critic. Um, he, you know, bashes all sorts of people. He's very uncompromising. But he, he finally writes this thing, The Raven. And that really puts him on the map. And originally he brings The Raven to this guy, Graham, who he had been working for. Uh, Graham was one of these people who was rich, had his own magazine, and Poe worked for him as an assistant for a while. Graham declines the poem. Says, ah, we can't publish this. But he gives him 15 bucks uh, for charity and says, you know, take care of yourself. And 15 bucks was quite a you know, good bit of money at that time. Poe publishes The Raven, and it takes off uh, immediately, and then he's able to publish The Raven and other poems, mm -hmm. right? And soon after that, he's going to start publishing things like The Philosophy of Composition, where he's actually talking about writing The Raven. Um, they, they eventually moved to New York, and at that time, it's now the Bronx, right? Because uh, there's the, the five boroughs. But at that time, Fordham, where Fordham University is, <clears throat> was a little Dutch village. And there were the Jesuits there, the Fordham University Jesuits now, and a bunch of other people around there. And they moved to this little place there. Um, and um, that's where um, Virginia is going to die of, of consumption. Um, after that, Poe doesn't actually wait that long before he starts trying to court this poet who will write a biography of him later on, Sarah Helen Whitman. Um, and then he, he returns to, to Richmond and he meets up with his childhood sweetheart, Sarah. Um, he also starts giving lectures, uh, and one of the lectures is this thing, Eureka, that, that we'll talk about in just a bit. Um, it doesn't go well. <laughs> as, as, you know, typical for, for Poe. But he is on lecture circuits now. He's giving talks, and he's, he's starting to, you know, make some, some decent money from time to time. Um, Edgar and Sarah, um, they start to look at the possibility of marriage. Her husband at that time had died, um, and the main thing that kept them from actually getting married, other than the fact that her kids weren't really big on the idea, was that there was a provision in her husband's will that if she remarried she would lose most of the inheritance. And so that, you know, that was a, a significant uh, impediment. And um, just about, I think it's about a week after they're having these conversations, Poe is in Baltimore. And people find him um, in the streets, just sort of out of, out of his head, kind of kind of raving. Um, he winds up at Washington Medical College, and there he dies, and nobody actually knows what he died of. There's, there's different theories. Um, it, clearly, he had a drinking problem. He probably had diabetes at the time. Um, there were probably a lot of other things wrong with him. We, we don't really know. But, I mean, people were dying all the time uh, of, of diseases back then anyway. So, you know, he's, he's not really uh, that old. He's um, 40 years old when he dies, you know. Um, and, you know, if you think about it, he doesn't actually leave that huge of a body of work behind. Um, it's a number of short stories and essays and quite a few poems. Um, what, you know, we've talked about what, what, what's there is sometimes frustrating to read, but there's a lot of really interesting ideas built into it. Um, and that's, that's part of what I wanted to talk about in, in uh, this. Before we do that, though, I, I wanted to talk a little bit about 
what happened to his reputation afterwards and, and, and at the time. So um, he's a contemporary of, of Emerson. And some people will contrast the two of them because Emerson is this big, you know, well-known transcendentalist figure, kind of an optimist about human nature and, and the universe, and sort of a, the, the new person coming out. Emerson really didn't like didn't like Poe at all. He he called him the Jingle Man, and he thought that that his work was kind of superficial. Uh, he thought that Poe himself was you know corrupt and and you know perhaps downright evil. Uh, Whitman didn't like Poe either. He, he actually said Poe was almost without the first sign of moral principle or of the concrete or its heroisms or the simpler affections of the heart. Um, so he, he thinks that, he also said that he was among the electric lights of imaginative literature, brilliant and dazzling, but with no heat. And electric light was a bad thing back then, right? So... Um, there's, there's quite a few people who, who don't like him. Then there's this guy, Griswold. And Griswold, you know, we have people like this today where they write these tell-alls and they're ready to air, like, almost immediately after the person dies or does something wrong or leaves office or, or whatever. And Griswold did that. He published this piece about Poe that a lot of people bought into and portrayed Poe as, as like, being a totally amoral, sensualist, you know, interested in beauty, kind of like a decadent, right? It probably didn't help that later on, th th that aspect, it wasn't probably helped later on by the fact that it was Baudelaire mm -hmm. uh, who translated Poe into French, because Baudelaire definitely was a decadent, you know? I mean, you read his poetry, uh, <laughs> and that's, that's quite clear. But this, this woman who he courted, um, Sarah Helen Whitman. Here's one of the things she wrote. She said, We're ready to admit with the severe critic of the North American that a very large proportion of Poe's stories are filled with monstrous and appalling images. Many of them oppress the reader like frightful incubi from which uh, influence he vainly tries to escape. Ruskin tells us in his treatise on the grotesque, it's the trembling of the human soul in the presence of death, which most of all disturbs the images on the intellectual mirror investing them with the grotesque ghastliness of fitful dreams. And he says, if the mind be not healthful and serene, the wider the scope of its glance and the grander the truths of which it obtains. And insight, the more fantastic and fearful are these distorted images. So she's, she's saying, yeah, okay, if Poe writes about horrific stuff, um, although you know, some of it's kind of tame compared to contemporary horror, I think, right? Or even Lovecraftian horror. Um, but at the time, it, it seems kind of decadent and... and um, you know, morbid. Then she says, yet as out of mighty and terrific discords, noblest harmonies are sometimes evolved, so through the purgatorial ministries of awe and terror, and through the haunting nemesis of doubt, <clears throat> Poe's restless and unappeased soul was urged on to the fulfillment of its appointed work, groping up blindly towards the light, and marking the approach of great spiritual truths by the very depth of the shadow it projected against them. So in Edgar, Edgar Poe and his critics, she's defending him and saying he actually did have some sort of moral project in mind. And, you know, he, she'll also direct people towards some of these passages that I, I've actually got here in the, the handout where he talks about a moral sense. Um, Poe wasn't entirely without that. She also points out, too, that for somebody who's not supposed to have had a conscience, he sure has a lot of stories in which somebody is tortured by conscience, like the Telltale Heart, you know, uh, or the Black Cat, or um, oh, there's another one uh, that, that she brings up as well. Um, so she's, she's defending him against, against his critics. And so we've got this two-sided thing, and I think a lot of people today Insofar as Poe is still part of popular culture, I think that he's, he's mostly associated with that kind of, you know, dark brooding, morbid, um, always looks at the bad stuff, you know. If, if he's interested in beauty at, uh, at all, it's like beauty of loss, uh, melancholy, as he says. Um, and and they, um, they don't look at the other stuff quite, quite so much. But he's, you know, he's really in the history of American 
writing and, and the history of literature in general is, is very important because he leads to the modern detective novel. Um, Arthur Conan Doyle credits Pope. Um, he writes some things that are clearly science fiction, um, like the case of uh, Mr. Valdemar. Um, and he's, he's definitely somebody who's, who's central in, in uh, the horror genre as well. And, you know, I didn't quite realize this until I started rereading his stuff. I, I'd, I'd gone through, you know, a, fra- a phase when I was reading a lot of Poe, actually out of these volumes um, from that used to be my great uncle's, uh, about 15 years ago. And I was struck by how much philosophical content there is, both in, in the sense of sort of broad philosophical themes where um, ideas are just being talked about but not being attributed to a particular thinker, and then references that Poe has to you know, Plato, Aristotle, Epictetus, uh, Pascal, Kant, Mill, you know, all, all these different thinkers, um, sometimes even plays around with it. Like he says, you know, um, Mill wrote a, he has a, he has a character who's like set uh, many years in the future, and Eureka, who says that, you know, there was this guy, Mill, and he rode a horse named Bentham. Uh, <laughs> Bentham was, was an important early utilitarian, and Mill is his, his successor. Um, so clearly Poe, you know, was very well read, um, knew quite a bit of what he was talking about, wove those, those things in and um, had a significant influence on these, these genres of speculative fiction. It's unfortunate that he didn't get much recognition in his own time. What he did get was primarily just for The Raven, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, it's sort of like being, what would it, I mean, is there anybody you could think of who they, they deserve to be known for like their whole body of work, but they got known for just one song or one painting or something like that? I mean, we talk about one-hit wonders in music, right? Uh, and usually one-hit wonders really are one-hit wonders. They only had one good song, and that was, that was it. But there's, I think there's, some, there's quite a few people who have really great stuff, mm-hmm. but we don't know it until we buy the album or the, yeah. the CD, you know, or go hear them in concert. Um, I don't know, has anybody come to mind offhand? Well, well, I think in terms of artists, yeah, yeah okay, sculptors and artists, it's not unusual to be known for, for just some one of the thing. great ones to maybe have some credit for one thing, and then after they die, this oh. whole body of work. Yeah, yeah. I was thinking of Da Vinci because I think Da Vinci, yeah. Michelangelo, well, even, even Picasso. You know, he's so even known Picasso. for the later work, but when you see his earlier work, he's, which was all very figurative and realistic. Um, you know, you realize he went through the whole gamut. <laughs> you know, Van Gogh, yeah. you, you can look at uh, any number of artists, you know, who are today considered masters. Yeah. But the Died body of work at the time and, yeah. was cons- not considered important. Well, the reason I was talking about Da Vinci is because he was primarily known for, like, The Last Supper and a few of his frescoes, but hardly any of his inventions and all of the other things that he was mm-hmm. in his sculpture. And he did so many other mediums, and he was not really recognized for that till later because they're all just kind of focusing on the seven frescoes that he did. Mm-hmm. You know, there were, there were some even some philosophers like that. David Hume is a good example. You know, you, if you take an intro to philosophy class, you, you're going to run into him. And he's got all these important thoughts about, you know, cause and effect and association of ideas that, that lays the ground for associationist psychology. But in his own day, people knew him basically as like a literary um, critic and a historian. And that's where he made his money, is writing this, this big history of England. You know? But that wasn't really where his heart was. His, his first book, which people look at now and they're like, this is, this is a work of genius. He said it fell stillborn from the press. It was this treatise of human nature. <clears throat> he had it printed at his own expense. Couldn't sell the copies. <laughs> you know? So, yeah. Just ahead of their time. Sometimes. Adam mm-hmm. Smith, too, because now he's the Wealth of Nations guy, but he worked so hard on theory of moral sentiments, and I think yeah. you have to be into philosophy to know about that one. 
Yeah, and I don't think too many people in philosophy actually <clears throat> know, know of Smith as something more than just the invisible hand guy, you know. Um, they don't realize he's part of that uh, um, Scottish um, enlightenment, they call it, you know, that Hume and Reed and all those people were, were part of. Yeah, it's, too, it's, it's unfortunate. It's definitely not a fair world, is it? <laughs> Arthur Conan Doyle wanted to be known for something other than Sherlock Holmes. Yeah, it wasn't mm -hmm. going to happen. No. <laughs> you know, somebody else who we talked about in here, since we're on this topic of like being not being recognized for what you'd like to do, um, Philip K. Dick wrote these really great realist novels, couldn't get them published in his day, because he was a science fiction mm -hmm. author, mm -hmm. and they were, they were like, just... You quit doing this this stupid stuff. Why don't you just write some more science fiction stuff? Because we can sell that. And um, and actually, the things that are considered realist novels, it's not as if they don't have any um, science fiction themes in them. But um, nobody would touch them, you know. And and he he spent a lot of time trying to sort of break out of that. Uh, I guess you could call it sci-fi ghetto. Um, I mean, he wrote some really really great sci-fi stuff too, but. It's too bad. Poe actually wrote across genres. You know, we've got some horror stuff. He wrote a lot of humor stuff, too, and satires. Um, I, I wasn't really going to talk that much about, about those, and I didn't put those into the list, but he, he had a kind of acerbic wit, you know, when it came to things. But let's, let's talk about some, some big, big picture themes and ideas. So I, I thought that some of them that were kind of interesting to, to look at were um, death, you know, and how we, how we understand death. It plays such a big role in many of his stories. Um, another theme is, is people trying to escape from their destiny or their fate, but they're never able to do so. Uh, the fall of the House of Usher is a, a good example of that. Um, there's also a lot that explore human passions and motivations, usually um, not very particularly good ones, you know, violent ones. Um, he also, uh, you know, talks quite a bit about the nature of beauty and why beauty is, is so important. And, and some of the selections that I have here um, go into that. So maybe that's a good one to jump into. Um, in, in these two pieces, the philosophy of composition and the poetic principle where he's talking about um, not just his own writing process, he, he actually walks you through how he wrote The Raven, interestingly enough, in the philosophy of composition. Oh, really? Yeah, he tells you, I started with, you know, this, this thing in mind, and then I, that's, that's the goal or end, and then I, you know, started thinking about, well, what would I do in order to get there? And um, how do I do that? And how do I do that? And he walks you down to the level of like, well, this is why I use the O so often in this. And here's why I, I chose this meter. And here's why I chose a raven rather than something else. <clears throat> um, and then the word nevermore could, could fit in for this reason. Um, so it's, it's quite, it's pretty interesting. It's almost like, you know, another thing he's known for is the detective stories. And a lot of his detective stories are essentially tracing out reasoning processes about what, what happened, what took place, what must be the case. And so he's, he's actually giving you a little bit of a detective story about how he came up with this, this great poem. Um, but let's look at this thing from the philosophy of composition. So he says, um, beauty is the sole legitimate province of the poem. And I think a lot of people would agree with, with that. You know, poetry is, is not necessarily, in, in the classic sense, it's not necessarily supposed to do anything other than make us, you know, enjoy it, produce some pleasure. So he says, a few words in education of my, my real meaning. The pleasure which is at once the most intense, most elevating, and most pure is, I believe, found in the contemplation of the beautiful. When people speak of beauty, they mean precisely not a quality, as is supposed, so not, it's not something that's in the thing, but an effect. 
they refer to that intense and pure elevation of soul, not of intellect, nor of heart, upon which I have commented and which is experienced in con consequence of contemplating the beautiful. So I think that's an interesting thing right there. Um, he, he's talking about, it doesn't have to do with the intellect, it doesn't have to do with the heart. Those are different faculties. He'll talk about that a little bit more later on. So he says, I designate beauty as the province of the poem merely because it's an obvious rule of art that effects should be made to spring from direct causes. I'm going to skip through a little bit of that. Then he says, the object truth or the satisfaction of the intellect and the object passion or excitement of the heart are, the, although attainable to a certain extent in poetry, far more readily attainable in prose. You can, you can do that, you know, you can, you can satisfy the requirements of the intellect much more easily in, in prose because you don't have to worry about meter and rhyme and all this other stuff. Um, so he says, truth demands precision, passion, a homeliness, which are absolutely antagonistic to that beauty, which I maintain is the excitement or pleasurable elevation of the soul. He says, it doesn't follow that passion or truth may not be introduced, even profitably introduced into a poem, for they may serve in elucidation or aid in the general effect. But the true artist will always contrive, first to tone them into proper subservience to the preponderant aim, secondly to unveil them as far as possible in that beauty which is the atmosphere and essence of the poem. You know, later on, um, somebody like Oscar Wilde will talk about art for art's sake, right? And mm -hmm. one of the questions that comes up constantly is, what is art for? Is, and, and with poetry, where it's language, um, what, what is poetry supposed to do? Is it supposed to, like, teach us what kind of people we ought to be? You know, should it be very didactic? Should it be, like, consoling and make us feel good about our, our situation? Um, should it, um, you know, we think about other poetry. Should it help us to uh, sell songs? Or should it help us to uh, get in bed with somebody? People write poetry for those reasons. Or should it be to produce this effect of beauty? Should that be the, the one thing that centers everything? And for, and for Poe, there's no sort of like, well, it's beauty, you know, kind of sappiness or anything like that with it. He means something that like almost electrifies you, that, that um, you know, brings you into, uh, uh, he doesn't use the term like enchanted circle, but I think you can yeah, say get, something. Like I don't that. get that melancholy, that next line, melancholy ah. is the <clears throat> most legitimate because bringing yeah. someone to tears doesn't mean that they're melancholy. It means that they're touched by something beautiful, which well, this doesn't is have to be sad. Yeah, yeah. This is this is poem. Um, I think you're you're right about that. So he he then in that essay takes kind of a turn, <clears throat> and I didn't include the the other thing that comes after that. He says. Uh, regarding beauty as my province, the next question referred to the tone of its highest manifestation. All experience has shown this tone is one of sadness. Now, whose experience, right? Yeah, right. His, I think. Yeah. Not, not ours necessarily. And, and you're right. Sometimes, like, I find myself, um, you know, when we're watching a movie or something like that, sometimes tearing up at stuff, and I'm like, what the hell's going on with me, you know? And, and some of it makes good sense. Like, I see... Uh, uh, somebody at a funeral for their parent, and I, you know, I lost my parents a, a long time ago, and sometimes it brings up that sort of thing, especially if there's like music in the background. But sometimes I'll see somebody doing a a uh, you know morally significant sacrifice, um, and I feel I feel kind of I like tear up seeing it and I'm like what the hell is this about you know this is a good thing right but it, it's it's a it's a sort of affective reaction to some kind of beauty uh, you know good actions really noble actions are beautiful actions mm -hmm. um, and they're being depicted in, in an artistic way um, and, you know and some of it's silly it could be in a sci-fi show <laughs> you know <laughs> or, or some fantasy show um now, he thinks that melancholy, like you said, is the most legitimate of the poetic tones. So not just sadness, but, but melancholy. And then he goes on a little bit further and he says, 
the best way to do this is with the uh, loss of a beautiful woman. Yeah, I was just saying, lost love. Yeah. Yeah. Well, poetry basically is, you know, an expression of the soul. I mean, words that you can't get out always in prose. You can yeah. just, you you could just manifest in poetry, and that's what it basically is. And that's why it's it's something you have to just sit with. You can't just read it. You ha you have to really go into it to discover what the poet is really trying to say with that. But they're just, and maybe he's expressing melancholy because he's. You know, he's that's where he's coming. This is an expression of his soul. It's beauty, but at the same time, it's coming from where he is. Do we have any poetry though that's really about uh, the simpler, joyful things? Whitman. Whitman, a little bit. Yeah. It's it's still a kind of a melancholy about the beauty he sees as impermanent. Yeah, I, I, but he—I mean—he's so exuberant yeah. in, in his writing, um, and he's—you know—he's a contemporary of of Paul. Um, I, I think most poets, I think of yeah, it as is being gloomy sorts. They are. It is melancholic because they're frequently writing uh, Elizabeth Barrett Browning. They're frequently writing about losses. Well, and, you know, there's love loss there too, yeah. or, or, yeah. or repression. Yeah. Or Sounds for the Portuguese is kind of sweet because it's about finding it love is. after yeah. loss. Yeah. So there's sort of a but there's a loss there. in there. There's a yeah. lot. That's, yeah. Yeah. It's about emotion. Yeah. Well, that's that's it's how about, you, yeah, it's that's about what, emotion. That's what poetry is an expression yeah. of, of your emotion and so on. Yeah, the deep the deep parts that you just can't put any other way. I like what you were saying though a little bit earlier about you have to take your time with it because I think I think you're completely right about that. You can't appreciate what's going on in a poem reading it on a timetable, and, and that's unfortunately the way that I think most of us encounter poetry. Um, it's either like you know we got it in school and we're doing this poem this day and we've got you know thirty minutes to go over this one, you know, and and it, maybe we also have to be like in the right um, frame of mind. So it's not enough just to have the right amount of time. Maybe you can't you can't read certain kinds of poetry when you're distracted by thinking about your you know grocery list or uh, you know filling out your taxes or. Well, I, what I your read, kids are doing? I like or, the use of grass. I've got it sitting uh, there, and I just pick it up every once in a while, and I just, yeah, I just like that. Um, I like Mary Oliver's poetry. She's a contemporary poet, but she's she writes a lot about nature and the natural environment. I like her. Um, so I mean, there's just certain things sometimes that. Well, there's probably different poets for different people. Like I, yeah. you know, I, I particularly like Rilke, and I can't read all of his poems at any given time. Some of them are more like demanding than others I think but there there's some of his poems that I could like like you were saying I could you know any spare moment I could pick them up and relate to them uh Andy uh my wife really really loves Simborska um and uh I've read some of her stuff and I, I don't get quite the same thing out of it you know I, I, I'm there's something I'm not getting. Well, you, you have know? to bring your own personal emotion to it, also, because I said that's yeah. why you have to sit with it. Because the interpretation sometimes is very subjective. Yeah. You know it, and even though there is an, there is some objective thing there by the poet, but it, it is subjectively relating. To, I mean, I don't know. That's just. I mean, I'm not a student of poetry, but I'm just sort of blah blah blathering here. But that's just how I. No, but to that's it. that's. I think that's important. Mm -hmm. to, you know, poetry has become kind of a preserve, right, for, for academics and for the, the you know, the, the elites. But one of the things that the romantics were really insistent about is that poetry should be able to reach the ordinary person. And if it doesn't, um, I mean, it could require some elevation, right? Um, but but if it can't reach the ordinary person, there's something wrong. It's not it's not the ordinary person's fault all the time. It could be the poet's fault, and I think a lot of contemporary poetry, um, you know, it, it it's just it kind of misses the mark. A lot of it too is is very um, either like hyper personal or hyper political, as well. And you know, I I like you know learning about other people's stuff, but I don't want to have to like decipher somebody's you know codes for all of their little personal experiences um there's very few people i'm willing to do that for you know 
this is this is aiming at something a bit more universal. But but going back to the melancholy thing, yeah, why does it have to be melancholy? Why can't why can't it be joy or anger or hope or something something else? Anxiety maybe, you know? Have we done the Gwen? Yeah. Yes. yeah. Because I'm reminded of the quote from uh, Once You Walk Away from Omelas about how we consider sadness like the only serious or respectable emotion, like happiness is always somehow fake. Or childish. Yeah. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah. Hmm. You know, a, a philosopher. This is a little bit really off track, but there, the, the philosopher who made a big deal out of emotions and, and picked one as being like the emotion that reveals being in the world to us was, was Heidegger, uh, Martin Heidegger, and he said anxiety, angst. This is, you know, he's like one of the main existentialist figures. That's the one that reveals the world to us, unlike other emotions. And I always thought that's kind of BS, you know? Why couldn't hope be just as, as revelatory of, of reality? Maybe, maybe some emotions, like anger, often gives us a distorted view of things. But, well, but think, about, think about this one. I'm sitting here listening, thinking, when do we do the most introspection? Okay. Not during joy. We or could. During, we do maybe a little bit. Yeah. But when we do the most, is during those times of strong anxiety or negative emotion, when we have to look inside ourselves to figure out. I wonder our place in the world and what's going on. We don't tend to when we're, when we're joyful, when we're happy, when we're floating along. We don't tend to do that introspection. And I think poetry gets at some of that introspection. Yeah. Not that there are not joyful poems. Don't you think that maybe we could learn to cultivate the the capacity? I mean, that's part of I think what maybe we should. But some we... some ascetic traditions do um, when they're not like you know just fasting or stuff like that. They try to get you to like actually feel grateful for um, the fact that you're alive and you know spring has come or something like that you see that in spiritual you know? retreats and that kind of thing yeah so if a person did that and they did that over and over again then maybe they would get more out of joyful poetry mm -hmm. you know or even poetry that you can't quite realize is is joyful until you're in the proper frame of mind i have a friend who's a poet but he writes haiku okay which is an entirely different mm -hmm. yeah. style and approach yeah. to looking at the world. But it can have oh, it can joy. Have very strong. It can have calmness. I mean, yeah. it's, yeah, it's, mm -hmm. it elicits lots of emotions, mm -hmm. I think. Yeah. You know, another one that's a, a positive emotion is uh, awe or wonder, mm -hmm. right? And that could, that could be... Uh, we talked about that with Lewis. Yeah. Uh, because his awe and joy was very relevant to Yeah, that's transition. right. Yeah, and, and we're going to, you know, Chesterton and Lewis, we're going to talk about Chesterton next time, are very similar in that respect. Um, they're, you know, they're both explicitly religious authors, but part of what's cool about them is they're, they're into a sort of robust the world is a good place uh, kind of religiosity rather than like this kind of namby-pamby, you know, let's all just go to church and be glum kind of thing, you know? <laughs> yeah. Um, coming back to, to this, so the, there's another thing here w in terms of uh, beauty and, and uh, these other faculties that I, I just wanted to hit on very quickly. So this is from the Poetic Principle. And Poe talks, again, about intellect and the moral sense. And then he talks about this, this faculty of taste or, or discrimination or judgment. This is something, taste was, was uh, not just like having good taste in furnishings or things like that, but being able to make good judgments um, at, at the time. And he says that um, dividing the, the world of the mind into pure intellect, taste, and the moral sense, I place taste in the middle because it's just this position which in the, in the mind it occupies. It holds intimate relations with either extreme. But from the moral sense, it's separated by so faint a difference, Aristotle has not hesitated to place some of its operations among the virtues itself. But 
we, we find the offices of the trio marked with a sufficient distinction. So this is how they're different. Just as the intellect concerns itself with truth, so taste informs us of the beautiful. That's the province of taste, to tell us what actually is beautiful as apart from what's, you know, maybe appears beautiful in the moment but isn't really beautiful. Um, and the moral sense, it has to do with duty. And he goes on, he says, of this latter, the moral sense, while conscience teaches the obligation and reason the expediency, taste cont contents herself with displaying the charms, waging war on vice solely on the ground of her deformity. And I think this is really interesting because here he's talking about something that addresses his critics, you know, saying Poe is this, you know, degenerate guy, mm -hmm. you know. He's saying that um, you wouldn't want to be vicious because being vicious is ugly it, or it's, it's deformed. Um, there's something wrong with it. So he says, uh, vice has got a disproportion. It, it's animosity to the fitting, to the appropriate, to the harmonious, in a word, to beauty. So in a way, if you want to enjoy beauty, you can't be a scoundrel. You can't be a Philistine. You can't be, uh, you know, somebody who's motivated solely by making money uh, or attaining power or any of those sorts of things. So he says, an immortal instinct deep within the spirit of man is a sense of the beautiful. This is what administers to his delight in the manifold forms and sounds and odors and sentiments amid which uh, he exists. The struggle to apprehend the supernal loveliness has given to the world all that which it, the world has ever been enabled at once to understand and to feel as poetic. And then he says, to recapitulate, I would define in brief the poetry of words as the rhythmical creation of beauty. So that's a good, mm -hmm. good way to talk about it. And then he says, its sole arbiter is taste. So again, art for art's sake, right? Yeah. The intellect doesn't get to decide. It can have its little, you know, role in there, but it's really, poetry is not really about satisfying the intellect, nor is it about satisfying the conscience. It's about satisfying uh, our faculty of taste, which would be something distinct. And you could imagine that maybe some people who are really great intellects could be totally lacking in taste. Or some people who are really great people, you know, in a moral sense, might also still be lacking in this, this faculty of taste, that it would have to be cultivated in different ways. So, and, and a fully well-rounded person, I, I imagine, would have all three of these developed, you know, not, not just one or two, but all three. So, yeah, I thought that was, that was an interesting uh, discussion he had there. Um, now, what about these characters that he's got who are pretty bad people? What do we make of them and their motivations? Does, does that match up with this at all, or is there oh, yeah, contradiction? Oh, there's lots of stories where the, the person, in, the, the character is, has no ability to see beauty. Okay, like, like what, which ones do you... Well, I think Pit, Pit and the Pendulum. Okay. Uh, um, House of Wax, some of the... Three. Because he's terrified, right? Yeah, but there's no ability to see... Beauty, beauty. In, in his situation. Most of the characters that are have some problems or would be considered maybe immoral or whatever do get punished. Yeah. You know, so it's not like he's promoting... Immorality. Immorality or evil or, you know, murder or anything like mm -hmm. that. They all seem to get punished <laughs> yeah. in the end. Mm -hmm. Yeah, quite a few of them, like, reveal themselves, right? They, they're tortured in some way. It, it, it's interesting. It's, it's, not, it's not like they have this direct conscience that just, you know, convicts them or something like that. One of the ones that I wanted to talk about is this, this story, The Imp of the Perverse, um, and it starts out being more like a treatise, and then it turns into a story. Have any of you guys read that one? No. So it's similar. He's saying a similar thing to what Dostoevsky uh, in Notes from the Underground is, is saying, that, that we human beings, um, we seem to be very reasonable and rational and well put together, but there's something in us that will sort of self-sabotage, that will, will undermine our, ourselves 
And we can ask, you know, when a person does that, well, what do they really want? Like, you know, you go to a, a psychologist, right? And what does the psychologist or counselor do? So what, are you, what are you trying to do with this? And they, they assume that you're, you know, there's like maybe a rational explanation underneath. You know, I'm, I'm trying to please my, my dad or I'm trying to, you know, um, I'm trying to feel secure or something like that. And Poe says, yeah, okay, sometimes that's the case. And sometimes we just don't have any reason at all. We're, we just do the, the stupidest things <laughs> to do the stupidest things. Dostoevsky has his underground man say stuff like that. After You know, like, that'd be like, uh, what, 40 years later, 50 years later. Uh, and, and, you know, you could think of it as kind of whim. And, and Poe says, this is from The Imp of the Perverse, um, in the consideration of the faculties and impulses, the primo mobilia, the, the prime movers of the human mind, Phrenologists, the people who would like feel your, your, your skull and tell you about things, failed to make room for a propensity, which, although obviously existing as a radical, primitive, irreducible sentiment, has been overlooked by all the moralists who preceded them. In the pure arrogance of reason, we all overlooked it. We suffered its existence to escape our senses. Uh, he goes on and he says, the idea of it never occurred to us simply because of its super arrogation, which means like it's, it's superfluity. It, you know, it, it doesn't need to, to, to exist. And he says, we saw no need of it. We cannot perceive its necessity. So what is this? He, he says, um, it would have been wiser. It would have been safer to classify upon the basis of what man usually or occasionally did and was always occasionally doing. Um, induction would have brought phrenology to admit as an innate and p primitive principle of human action a paradoxical something, which we may call perverseness, for want of a more characteristic term. And now here's where it gets really interesting. He says, in the sense I intend it, it is a mobile without motive. So it doesn't have any, any reason to it. It does move us. And he says, a motive not motivirt. Through its promptings, we act without comprehensible object, or if this shall be understood as a contradiction in terms, we could say that through its promptings, we act for the reason that we should not. So somebody says, don't push that button. There's going to be some person who's going to go over and push that button. <laughs> and you can tell them, you can like say, if you push that button, the room will fill with poisonous gas. You know, and they're like, well, I don't really believe you. Well, here, let me show you the movie, and this is what happened to all the other people who pushed the button. And most people, you know, most of the time won't push the button. There's always going to be somebody who's going to push that button. And he gives you, he gives you examples of people. Like, like, compulsions. What's that? I said compulsions. Yeah. Well, and, and the compulsion happens when somebody says, don't do that. Mm -hmm. Or this would, this would be bad for you to do. Um, and, and, you know, we, do we experience this? I know I've done some dumb stuff like that. There's yeah. a toddler's book. I gave it to my great nephew <laughs> last year for his birthday called Don't Push the Button. Oh, really? <laughs> Is there a button on the book? There's a button on the book, and it's a board book, and it, it's got several, you know, in situations. <laughs> but the, it's Don't Push the Button. That's it, funny. It's one of his favorite books because he wants to push the button. You know, uh, Bruce Dickinson, the the lead singer of Iron Maiden. He, I read his biography, uh, or his autobiography recently, and um, I think it's it's titled something like "What Does This Button Do?" or something. And he talks about himself as being the the kind of guy who can't can't you know not push the button. Well, you when, see when that it's there. you see that theme in a lot of areas. Doctor Who. Oh, yeah. The last... Do uh, How so? That, well, the 11th Doctor, Matt Smith, was always talking about wanting to push the button. Mm -hmm. Oh, interesting. Yeah. In, in yeah. the TARDIS. There was always something about yes. the red button. Okay. <laughs> wanting to push the button. Yeah. Yeah. See, Poe talks in this... He gives a couple examples, and I didn't put them on the thing. One of them is like being on the edge of a cliff, and like mm -hmm. you know you shouldn't go any, any closer to it. But, you know, you're kind of drawn to it. And, and then you get to the edge and you feel kind of a sense of vertigo because you don't know if you're going to throw yourself off or not. And you're like, why would I throw myself off of a cliff? That's irrational. Well, we do dumb stuff. We do dumb, irrational things. I remember standing at Niagara Falls, this is 50 or 60 years ago, when you could get really close. Oh, to really? Oh, yeah. The water goes right over. I mean, you could get within yeah, a few feet I, of that. Yeah. yeah. They, they, 
move that back since then. But Probably because so you're, people wa you're watching screwed all up, of right? this water going going down and going over and it's very um, it's magnetic. It's magnetic. It's you magnetic. want to go with it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah it's very I mean, magnetic. I, yeah. I was looking at it thinking, wow. <laughs> I was there, I was there around that same time when yeah. you could get really close. Yeah. Interesting. It's, it's a very magnetic sense. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It sounds. He also talks about um, taking people off in conversations, going into like, you, you know that the person doesn't want to hear a long-winded explanation, mm -hmm. but you do it anyway. And you, as you can see them getting more and more irritated, you like stretch it out even further. <laughs> <laughs> now that's just perverse. That's yeah. <laughs> well, but, yeah, but you that's think about it, perverse. you know, why is it perverse? Because we should want to get along with people or we should want to communicate effectively or something like that, right? Well, because you know you're doing something that's going to take the person off. <laughs> you, yeah. know, you know you're doing something that's going to make the other person uncomfortable or irritated. Is this where the whole theory of reverse psychology came about? No, I don't. I don't, I don't think. I don't think that's it. But because you know, it, at the very end of, of that section of it, he says um, something quite quite interesting. He says, uh, um, "Examine these and similar actions as we will. We shall find them resulting solely from the spirit of the perverse." We perpetrate them merely because we feel that we should not, right? So there it starts to, you know, it's always bad, right? Mm -hmm. And then he says, Be beyond or behind this, there is no intelligible principle, and we might <laughs> even deem this perverseness a direct instigation of the arch fiend. But then Moriarty. He, what's that? Moriarty. 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 Yeah. <laughs> Were it not occasionally known to operate in furtherance of good? Every once in a while, because somebody's perverse... They actually do the right thing. And that would be Doctor Who, right? Possibly. <laughs> well, my, my, my husband has a phrase that he can't help but pull the dangling chain. Okay. So, mm -hmm. you know, if somebody kind of leaves an opening, he can't help but pull the chain and, and well, say something that he knows the other person is going to be a little uncomfortable about. <laughs> I mean, not, not bad things, but... Yeah. Um, you know, especially in our current political environment, oh. somebody who's kind of, eh, um, he may deliberately say something to cause them to think. Yeah. To, it may not cause them to think. It may just cause them to react. <laughs> yeah. Well, he, causing to think is a good thing. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I was just thinking, you know, wouldn't it be interesting if we figured out a way to harness this for pedagogy, you know, but I don't know how you would do it. Um... I mean, I've had students every once in a while who wanted to, they, they had weird motivations and they were going to like write a really long paper to show me and it turned out to be quite good, you know. Um, I don't think they were aiming at that, but. It would, the only way you could use it if you, is if you could predict the, the people who, could, who would always do this, you know, who would always do the opposite or the perverse, but I don't know that you can always predict. By its very nature, you can't. That's yeah. that's yeah, a problem. By its very nature, you can't. So, yeah, you could. It's it's sort it's of nature like nature is perversity. <laughs> well, he he ha, he sort of hints in here as if it's it's um, something that is because we're living beings. It's part of our, our vitality. It's part of what, what helps us out. The, and you know, if you think about it, if we, if, we didn't, if we only did what was reasonable all the time, we'd be like robots. Mm -hmm. So maybe it does help every once in a while to deviate from our programming. You experience. You how know what works and what doesn't. Well, yeah. Yeah. How, many of us did, how many of us did not do stupid things when we were younger? I, I did a lot of stupid things. I say, how many of us could say we didn't do stupid things when we were young? I'd probably be the pack here. We pushed the limits, <laughs> you know, we just by I nature. Seriously. Yeah. As human beings, and you see it in children as they grow and uh, young adults, we push limits. <laughs> you know, one of the things I did when I was a kid? So I, I had a boom box and I was out in the garage and we had a long extension cord and I was plugging the boom box in and my, my thumbnail touched the, uh, the tine of the, mm -hmm. the, uh, the plug, right? And it went in, and I got a shock, and it, it hurt because it was like 110 volts. And then I was like... You know, I did it again. Well, I was... I, I, was, <laughs> I used to do it all the time. I used to love to sit in my fingers and socket when I was a kid. I was just a weirdo. I was, I was like, 
Was that really an electric shock? Let me try it. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I've I been this, this for some neighbors, and they, every once in a while, they start talking about their childhood and their life, and I sit there and I'm going, the worlds are so small. You know, I think of like my realm of experience just because I was just a real person that did everything. Um, there wasn't the sort of oversight that that kids there, these well, days. Well, I didn't. Do. I didn't have any parents or boundaries, so I just my whole world was just experiential. Well, yeah, there are, there are yeah. people who just have grown up in very small worlds. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there are other people. This big. Yeah, I've always, I've always had this theory oh, that whenever you're outside the bell curve, when you're you're out here, you know, the, most people are in here and the yeah. big bell. But when you're on the outside, it doesn't matter what it is, what, it, what aspect it is. Mm -hmm. But when you're outside, you have a much better view of what's going on than the people who are in the middle. And so I always, I always like being on the outside of many yeah, issues me because yeah. even though you could feel a little alienated, you were still able to get this broader picture. Of yeah. Well, the more you learn, the more you're able to relate and do all these other things. The more experiences you have, yeah. the more you can, you know, just mm -hmm. be a more worldly person. But. Yeah. I, think, I mean, going back to Poe, I think you could say he was an outsider in yeah, that sense definitely. all the time. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of his characters are, too. You know, like in, in the Purloined Letter, um, the way that the guy is able to... You, you know, he's, he has to get this letter that's got compromising information on it, and this, this person has disguised it as, like, in plain view as this other letter... Um, so he he goes through this sort of strategic reasoning process, thinking about what would what how would another person react in this this situation, and how should I do these things? And he, he plans it all out, um, and he's able to do that precisely because he, he's one of these outliers. You know, mm -hmm. he thinks about what an ordinary person would do, yeah. and he does the opposite. You know, um, and that's sort of the whole point of the purloined letter thing. The ordinary person, like the cops, <clears throat> they go in and they look for things that are out of the ordinary, and they overlook this letter that's just sitting there, kind of tattered, uh, that has all the incriminating information in it. You know. Well, you see it with Sherlock Holmes. He's on the yeah he's outside the bell curve. Yeah. With Holmes, his me his methods of detection are he talks about his deduction, but it's, it's not deduction at all. It's it's all induction or what we call abduction where he's like in you know sort of inference to the best explanation and he, he goes in and he sort of like starts looking for clues right this leads to this leads to this leads to this um, and if it was deduction there should be necessary connections between all the things <laughs> there, and they're not there aren't it's almost lateral thinking though. yeah exactly you know, yeah it's different different way of connecting things yeah um, one of the other themes, oh, let's, let's, let's talk about the death theme a bit uh, before we, we run out of time. Um, so, you know, what is death and how does it connect up with, with the, the living? Um, that's something that get, gets portrayed a lot. And there's characters who get buried alive, of course. We had a whole big thing about catalepsy on telling death. I mean, I read... Well, read it was, a, it was a fear of the time. Stories I never read before. Yeah. So I was reading in these, and these stories I had never heard of. And they're all just really bizarre. Um, so I don't remember a lot. I mean, I remember some of the old, the, the, the real popular stuff. Yeah. But Everything I read in here, some woman was buried alive and came back. <laughs> and well, the only one that I had read before was Light G. And, and I, and I remember seeing that movie and it creeped me out. But um, you know, coming back, you know, scratching on the coffin and all that nonsense. That'd be a particularly horrific way to go, you know, because mm -hmm. think about it, you're, you're first you're you're per perceived as dead by everybody, so they put you in a coffin and put you underground. Now you do get to die. After first well, panicking that's right, and trying, that's why they had the bell, you know, by yeah. the bell. That was that was just so people could ring the bell when they were in their coffins, and if they're they saying, I'm still alive, go yeah. into the graveyard, and they hear a little bell ring, and say, okay, dig that guy up. But there, there are some stories where, like um, the the case of Valdemar, um, where Poe is is um, he talks about using mesmerism um, yeah, to has. to keep keep somebody. Um, at sort of at the threshold of death, but but the character who's who's um, dying actually does die, and he but he's able to speak, and he tells the people he's dead. So that means that there has to be some sort of existence 
after death, which, you know, that sounds really great because, oh, wonderful, there's an afterlife. Yeah, but it's a crappy afterlife, you know. It's a, you're, you're, you're in this nothingness, you know. You're, you're basically like one step away from total non-existence. And, you know, Epicurus had this really interesting argument why we shouldn't fear death. Do you know that one? So Epicurus, and there were other people who said this, don't worry about death at all because um, if it's, uh, you know, by the time that it happens to you, there's no you, right? Death is the cessation of your existence. So there's nothing to fear. There's nothing to, to suffer. There's no you after that. For Poe, there is still a you. There is still experience, but it's not, it's not good experience. And the, de- the dead are somehow like still connected to the living, but not in a not in a positive, productive way. The only way it's it's positive is like somebody's remembering their their dear departed you know loved ones or things like that. But when the when the loved one comes back from the grave, it's never good, you know. Even even though they're they're happy in some respect to see them. Well, they're 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 rotten. Changed. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> they're physically changed. They're emotionally changed. Like in that the story that I just reread, like Gia, that. Um, yeah, and that one. Was, yeah, was so, so so in love, you know, with with like Gia, she's this perfect woman. Then she dies, and then he remarries, and she he hears her scratching around, and all of a sudden there she is, and takes out the second wife. You know, so yeah, it's like. Um, but when she came back, she with the beauty that he described her in the beginning, like she was this perfect thing. That wasn't what was came. Well, there's what there, came back. There are multiple authors who have written stories about. That, that convey the be careful what you wish for yeah. theme. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. Monkey's Paw. Yeah. Yeah. Monkey's yeah. Paw. Yeah. 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 Um, the stories a, a, about genies and wishing on the lamp and things mm-hmm. like that. Yeah. Where True, you, yeah. You wish for some your loved one to come back. Um, there's, a, there's a mythology around the three princes. Um, and the, you know, he wishes for his lover to come back, and she comes back. Yeah. But she's dead. You know, she just... She's not what she was. Yeah, what um, was that? You I see mean, that? You see that in lots of literature. Stephen King, um, you know, who, who traces he Stephen King places himself in this lineage in one of his early essays where it's he you know drew upon Lovecraft, who drew upon Poe, so he's sort of like you know Poe's I don't know great grand yeah something <laughs> like that. Um, he's got that line in Pet Cemetery: "Sometimes dead is better," you know. Mm-hmm. Um, well, yeah, he does it with when the pets come back. Yeah, yeah. And they don't fully come back. They don't. Come, they're not the pet that you buried. <laughs> yeah, because <laughs> they part, when they come back, they're just not the same. <laughs> yeah, and I think a lot of people imagine death, and, and this is something I, I've seen, like you know, attending a lot of funerals, including some of you know close relatives. People want to have these consoling things, like, uh, oh, you know, they're in a better place. That, you know, I, I remember when my mom died, people, I, I ticked a lot of people off because I was in the receiving line at the funeral for like six hours. And towards the end, some of her uh, uh, friends that were coming through would say things like, oh, she's, she's an angel up in heaven now. And I was like, that's really terrible theology. Human beings don't become angels. We don't know she's in heaven. She could be in hell for all we know. You know. And then they just like shake my hand and get the hell out of there. People say the oddest things at funerals. That is true. But I think it's because they do have this idea that there's like a, there's the person as this disembodied soul and they remain exactly the same, untouched by the experience of death. And, and our TV shows portray it like that, right? Somebody, yeah. there's, a, there's like the... They're, they're kind of like a ghostly presence, yeah. mm-hmm. you know, but they otherwise look exactly the same. They have all the same uh, mannerisms. Whereas with Poe, death really changes you, you know, and, and experiencing other people's death even, even changes you. Um, I, I think a lot of people in our, our society don't know how to handle death. Um, well, I think that's why people look to the, this concept of the afterlife for consolation. Because yeah. they don't know how to handle death. Because people don't know what to well, do with it. we don't know. I mean, all of this is all, everything we make up, whether any kind of religious thing or this all human construct, to just explain the unexplainable. I mean, yeah. Well, I, I'm thinking in terms of dealing with the loss. Right. And it's hard to deal with a loss. Yeah. If you can tell yourself yeah. you'll be joined again, you know, you'll see them again, 
if you believe that, that can be, can be a, a great consolation mm -hmm. when, you, I, when you're experiencing this loss of someone you love so desperately. Yeah. I had an, ex I had an interesting experience, if you don't mind me indul indulging me in uh, something that happened back in uh, September. Um, I, I, I was in London. I'd flown there to speak at a conference. And then I was in the airport flying out, and I wanted to get my... I like English breakfast, so I was at this place where you could actually get, like, an English breakfast. And it was very, you know, um, uh, sort of upbeat music playing. And I'm sitting there, and I'm reading some stuff and, and eating. And then uh, a Paul McCartney song, a Wings song, came on. And, and I don't remember exactly what... It might have been uh, the Love Song one. And my dad was a huge Wings fan. And I was sitting there in the airport... And thinking about, you know, like, how weird it was that not only had I outlived him, he died when I was 11, but that I was way older now than he ever made it to be. He, he died when he was 36. And he died in 1982. And then I was thinking about, like, all the things that he's missed. And I wasn't, like, doing the, oh, he missed my graduation. I was just thinking, about, like, he missed cell phones, you know. He missed um, being able to get from Delafield to Milwaukee in less than an hour, because he used to have to do that commute every friggin' day, you know. Uh, and back then, it was an hour, <laughs> you know. Um, and and I and and then I what here's here's the sort of payoff. I was thinking about all this, and I was thinking about what he looked like and and what it was like to relate to him. And I, you know, I'm not an 11 year old kid anymore. I'm I'm so far from that. I can barely remember what a lot of that stuff was like. And I thought, how weird that. Um, He's still, in a sense, with me in such a vivid way, even though he's been gone for three quarters of, of my life. And this may be the only way he still exists. You know, I mean, he, according to his own views, he didn't believe in heaven or hell or anything like that. Um, he was kind of an agnostic. He still does exist in in, in my. Energy doesn't mm -hmm. go away. Energy yeah, just makes a new, just a new form. But it, I, I thought to myself, well, how strange is it that we human beings? Decades later can be carrying... Now, of course, what I'm carrying around is probably only just like the slimmest, you know, shaving of, of his Ooh, image. Right. Yeah. But the fact that we actually can do this, isn't it kind of miraculous that we, well, you what's know... What's the phrase? You're, you, you don't die if people remember you. There's a phrase. I yeah. I mean... Right. You know, yeah. something else that has happened to me over time, because my mother died 30 years ago or so... And um, what I have found is not only do I carry around this memory of her, yeah. but the memory, whatever her existence was, has actually been enhanced as I've reached these different ages and, been and, able and to, begin to, to, to realize, yeah, yeah. oh, now I know why she did that. Yeah. Uh, now I know, you know, what she was experiencing. And that, it just like actually enhanced her whole being for me and became closer to her in that way. So it yeah, there's something yeah. there's something paradoxical about that, yeah. right? Yeah. Sort of, I guess, related to the point. My dad died two years ago um, in a traumatic way. Oh. So I've been dreaming of him coming back, and it's always kind of interesting. It was a closed casket funeral, so I didn't get the closure of like yeah. saying, "Yeah, he's actually dead." So for a while, I'd have nightmares where like, "Oh no, it, it was like a mistake, and we buried the wrong body." So he'd come back alive. Yeah. And that was always really gothic. But even now, I sort of feel like my subconscious is trying to work these things out. And yeah, it's like, it's not even. You have that lack of closure thing that even yeah. in the dream, yeah. it's not a happy experience either. It's almost like Inger Ellen Poe, like, wow, you're, you're not supposed to be here. Even if I'd be <laughs> glad to see you, it's just so. Yeah, it's mixed emotions, so right? It's, yeah, so it's kind of fascinating. I'm sorry you had to go through that. Oh, thank you. No, I mean, really, it's, it's traumatic, and that's probably what this is. It is, yeah. Uh -huh. but. Yeah, I, you know, when, when my dad died, I, like, the week after, I had a dream where he, like, drove back up. We had, he had, we had a station wagon at the time, so he drove back up in the station wagon and came in the house and we were all very surprised to see him, you know, because we just had the, the wake and stuff. And he, uh, 
he was kind of puttering around, you know, like in the kitchen and stuff like that. And then we're, we're trying to talk to him, and he was, he was kind of preoccupied. And then he, like, turned and he said, I got to go. I, you know, see you later. And took off, you yeah. know. And I woke up from that, and I felt, I felt kind of pissed off. Yeah. I was like, what the hell was that? You know, and I, I knew enough about, like, you know, dreams and the subconscious at that time to, like, figure out, oh, I'm trying to, like, make sense of this. And then I thought, why the hell would I give myself a stupid dream like that? Why not give him... Maybe he's visiting you. Yeah, exactly. Why not give my, but why not give myself a better dream, you know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I had something like that happen right when my dad died. Uh, within probably two days, I had a dream, and uh, I can't remember the details, but something about him telling me things were all right, oh, basically. Okay. And at the time, I, I don't believe in an afterlife personally. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And at the time, the minister I had was like, oh, well, he was telling you that everything's fine. And he's, you know, he's, he's out there and he, you know, you'll see him later. And I went, no. And she, her response was, well, no wonder you're grieving so hard. If you don't believe, you'll see him again. Oh, interesting. Hmm. That you don't grieve as hard. She, her, her, Point, her view was the belief that you will see someone again Consoles in the afterlife you. helps to ease the grief. It yeah, probably does. For a lot of people, it does. Yeah. Yeah. For a lot of people, it does, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. But I, for me, it, I, I never believed in the afterlife. So, no, that had nothing to do with how hard I was grieving. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, like, yeah for I mean, me, it, yeah. that wasn't connected. Yeah. Uh -huh. You know, and, and you could think about, like... Uh, if you really do believe in the afterlife and sort of, let's call it old time religion, it's not a consoling thing because, you know, whether you take like, you know, Christianity or say, you know, Buddhism or something like that where you, you can be reincarnated. Well, you know, most people have probably lived a pretty crappy life, morally speaking, so they're going to wind up in hell or, you know, uh, they're going to they're gonna, they're gonna, yes. yeah, they're gonna, they're gonna be reincarnated into some, some other place, you know, and, and um, how do you know you're going to run across them? Maybe, maybe you will, maybe you'll both be in hell together and like suffering side by side. Yeah, it's not you know? a really natural effect to replace, but I, I yeah. think that your, your, your energy is still around in another form. It doesn't go anywhere. It's still, well, that's a different, yeah, that's, it, a, that, yeah. that's still there. And I mean, I, I can feel stuff. My daughter can see things, which is just, and there's people who can. I mean, she's, she sees people has conversations and you know freaked her friends out for a while but after they just got used to it and um, <laughs> um, you know she's like she moved in a new house on the east side and she'd kind of meet the guy who built the house and she'd have his name and everything she'd go look it up and there it was oh, so you figure cool. this stuff out yeah. you know yeah mm -hmm. <laughs> we just had to live with that growing up with her because she just always always saw people always saw people and, I've, um, I've had a few unusual experiences that I would and not And we've had some very unusual experiences at our house because we had that. a lot of death. We had like five deaths in one year, and some were very hard. Mm -hmm. And um, it was really hard on my husband, and he had he had some a wonderful experience you know, with his sister. So you just, I don't know, you have to yeah. be open to it or whatever, but as, as far as a hell or a heaven, no. no you, I don't so let me, let me ask, do you think... I think it's just different energy form. Do mm -hmm. you think that... Um, so, you know, on the one hand, we have, like, you know, sort of theological explanations of things or, you know, ministers consoling us or things like that. And then we have speculative fiction where there's all sorts of ideas. Like in Poe, you know, clearly there's, there's something that survives. But we have a lot of other um, authors that we look at. Does any of that help us figure, not, not giving us a blueprint because obviously it's fiction, but does any of it give us ideas for, like, how we could look at our own death or the death of others or I think it helps us think through what you may or may not believe mm -hmm. it helps yeah. us rash in a way I, rational may, may not the right word but I see it as a way to think through issues and mm -hmm. situations and I've always I've got a lot of friends who do not like science fiction or, or speculative fiction they mm -hmm. think it's uh, escapist Superfluous. Okay. Because, you know, it's yeah. like not yeah. worth their time. Yeah. And I try to explain. Not to serious, them. right? Yeah. 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 I try yeah. to explain to them. That's that what my husband feels. He does not understand. My stories husband too doesn't in understand general. it at yeah. all. Doesn't understand science fiction. Doesn't interest. Yeah. It, it, isn't interested in watching it. And I try to explain to them that really a good science fiction author, a good speculative fiction author, there's some pretty deep stuff. Yeah. In the stories, pretty deep. 
uh, discussions that you know, about that you if you think about it, mm. that leads you to think about all sorts of things, afterlife, whatever, yeah. um, morality, how we relate to other, each other as human beings. There's there's some really deep stuff in in speculative fiction, but so many people don't see it. Mm -hmm. yeah. They see it as silly or you know just escapism. And, I mean, admittedly, some of it is, you know. Some of it is. Uh, the space opera, you know, just I call zapping it cowboys everybody. in space. Yeah, yeah. 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 But, that wonderful, but that's that wonderful Star Trek episode where the two last two men on this world were fighting to the mm -hmm. death. Because one was black and white, one was white and black. Right? Oh, yeah. Yes. yes. I mean, that, obviously, that was taking off. There was, the a, there was a Twilight Zone episode yes. like that. Yes. Same sort of yes. thing, Same sort of thing, thing. Right? Well, if, if you read... Gene Roddenberry's biography, autobiography, he talks about he del he sold the series to the studio as Cowboys in Space. Yeah. You know, a hero. Yeah, yeah. You know, right, right, right. And he deliberately <laughs> went into it intending that every episode should have a moral, a moral undertone to it. Some kind, something about racism or gender or whatever. You know something that I read about recently, and we're very far afield from pulling out, but that's fine, uh, uh, about Star Trek was that one reason that it was difficult for the writers is um, Roddenberry insisted that because it's this fu you know, futuristic, sort of utopian um, setting, that the, none of the bridge officers should be in any sort of deep conflict with each other. They have some things like McCoy and Spock, you know, spar yeah, back and spark, forth, right. heart and mind. But right? nothing heavy. Exactly. No personal grudges, nothing like, nothing. none of the stuff that we have in normal dramas. Well, right? Rod, Roddenberry went beyond that. He gave every writer an outline and said, this is how this character behaves. Do not stray from it. Oh, interesting. Mm -hmm. this, then, is, this is who Spock is. This is who Kirk is. This is how they behave. This that would be tough they, to, to this do. This is what they believe. Whatever you write, yeah. you don't stray from this model of the of the universe, the Star Trek universe, and the characters. Well, that'd be tough to write that. Yeah, and I remember Melissa Snodgrass, who wrote one of my favorite episodes, which is the Measure of a Man, mm -hmm. how how to determine whether Data is a is a individual or, oh, next or is, is, yeah. is a property from of Star Trek of yeah, the, the Starfleet. And uh, she said that she had to write um, that. Roddenberry told her that in the future, this glorious future that he had, there would be no lawyers. There would be no need for lawyers, right? So they have to actually have the regular crew act as lawyer, prosecutor, all of that in this episode because they couldn't bring anybody else in. I'm sure it was also saving money, but... Yeah. but, but you know, but, that, that's funny, though, because in the new generation, it begins with, like, the Q problem, right? And doesn't mm -hmm. he put them in a, a, a court right, a, yeah. right but away? But there's no lawyers. Yeah, He's I guess the you're, judge. Yeah. The, the, the jury is a group of people. Yes, but they were all Qs. They were all Qs. <laughs> they, were <laughs> they, all were all Qs. Q. they were all Qs. They were all Qs in yeah. different forms. And, and they must have had fun with the costumes on that one. But yeah. Well, it's, it's not that far from Poe, though, because Poe writes with something in mind. Yeah. He's got morals. He's got his tales. The, the I th I think wrongdoers though, get their just desserts. You know, all of his tales. It really is though about follow about, a pattern. about um, it's not necessarily beauty. It could also be horror, right? But these are aesthetic rather than primarily moral uh, emotions. I, I, and I think, horror is a mirror to the beauty. Yeah. Sometimes. I think yeah. you can you can do something really negative it reflects what the positive image it's could Dorian Gray <laughs> like Dorian Gray yeah, like Dorian yeah, Gray exactly the positive image can be I mean if you if you see the oh, worst in somebody you can see what the best could be well and, and his translator in his poems um, tries doing that I mean Baudelaire is you know writing about how uh, roadkill could be could be beautiful. I mean, he doesn't call it roadkill because there wasn't roadkill at the time. But he talks about a uh, you know dead animal corpse rotting, and you can see the maggots and stuff like that. But he's trying to do it in such a way as, as the poetry itself is is beautiful. Um, 
And he does that with a, you know quite a few other images of his own as well. Um, and maybe he got that from Poe. I, I don't know. Um, well, is there anything, any other themes that you guys want to hit on before they kick us out of here? Because I know we're getting close to time. Um, well, I was reflecting on he had such a tragic life. Yeah. And how much of his poetry stories were tied to just the, the, the kind of tragedy in his life. Because he really had a tough life. Yeah. And part of it was his own doing with the drinking and this, this author suggests a certain he had, kind of volatility. Yeah, and this author suggests he had affairs, he cheated on his wife. Mm. Uh, so he, he wasn't the most moral person. Yeah. So, you know, you have to wonder. I think an author reflects their own life sometimes in what they're writing. Mm -hmm. They can't help it. I don't think they can help it. Well, definitely the theme of the beautiful woman who's, who's you know, disappearing, dying, that sort of thing is, is uh, central. He makes fun of the army. You know, that comes up in his humorous things. There's actually one story that I, I thought would be kind of cool to talk about where, where it's a... Uh, what is the name of it? The um, the man that was used up. Did, did any of you read that one? He's a, um, a general, if I remember right. And he has to be, like, he, he, most of him is prostheses. And he has to be put together uh, each day um, by his manservant. And it, it's because of these wars that he fought in against Indians and... He lost, you know, an arm here and a hand here and all that sort of stuff. And critics take it as being sort of Poe's uh, making fun of the, the military, you know, martial, uh, manly aspect and saying these, these, kind, these guys are kind of hollow men. Um, and some people take it as like Poe, you know, worried about a technological age that we're moving into and things are going to be, you know, we could be replaced by the machines. Um, but it's... it's uh, I mean, it's an interesting piece. Or is it Poe speculating on you lose pieces of yourself as you go through life? Well, especially if you get in scraps with people, right? Yeah, you get in scraps with people. You, yeah. He's a, he's a heavy drinker. You lose yourself. You lose your by, liver. By piece, by piece. <laughs> you could, by probably piece. could use a liver transplant, you know. Well, in this first story in here, um, when he's, to, well, a second, when he's, when he's talking about... Um, this Wil something Wilson, William Wilson. Okay, so it comes off that this, he starts off saying he's really a perverse, terrible man, or guy, and he's, st he's in school, and he's, he goes off to school, and he, he meets this other student who's got the same name, and basically he's paralleling this, except he's really good, so in every trait that this one has, he's got the good trait, and right, right down to the, you know, every, and he keeps saying, you know, he, he doesn't understand why this man is so, and then, like the last line, it was William Wilson, right? Yeah. William Wilson, um, yeah. I know you probably then yeah. just did. I hadn't read this one before. Um, and then they, they somehow get in this this fight with with a sword, and he said, you know, the um, the good William Wilson says, "You have conquered, and I yield, and yet henceforth." Art thou also dead, dead to the world, to heaven and to hope? In me didst thou exist, I hate this language, and in yeah. my death, see by this image which is thine own, how you have utterly murdered thyself. So, you know, he ends up basically killing off the good part of himself. You know, he just, he was such, he, he saw himself as such a terrible human being, even when he could see himself as good through the mirror of this other man, he en ended up having to kill that part off. So. Helpful. He hasn't murdered thyself. This language in here was just beyond. <laughs> yeah, it's, 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 it's worse. This was worse than the points. other stuff. I mean, it was so. Well, uh, next time uh, we'll do Chesterton.